Edwards Air Force Base is uh, really the aviation mecca for our nation and, and largely for the world. This is the best place in the world to fly. Edwards Air Force Base has a powerful asset that is unparalleled, and that is R-2508, an airspace that is restricted for commercial and advanced military testing. The R-2508 complex is 250 miles long and 150 miles wide. It provides a protected airspace for high-performance vehicles, maneuvers, and high-risk research and development for our nation's aerospace systems. As our skies have become congested, as air travel has become a predominant means of transportation, the value of this protected pocket of vertical real estate will become even more apparent for the testing of civilian, military, and space vehicles. We are on the cusp of a new era in aviation, and Edwards is positioned to be the launching pad that will propel our civilization to new heights still unimagined. I think all of us growing up saw, at least my generation, saw the Mercury astronauts through uh, landing on the moon with Neil Armstrong. But we also saw, I saw, uh, what was going on here at Edwards Air Force Base. Edwards and the surrounding area have a rich history as a testing ground for remarkable milestones in aerospace. The capabilities of Edwards include the dry lake bed and the low density population, as well as a skilled workforce that have all come together as a unifying force. The unsung hero that plays a pivotal part in all the aerospace advances is testing. The testing is critical because aircraft never work as designed. The testing is, it's the DNA of the high desert. Edwards houses the 412th test wing of the United States Air Force, the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School, NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center, the Air Force Test Center, and the Air Force Research Laboratory. All of these work for the defense of the United States as well as for the advancement of aeronautics on a global scale. The impressive array of vehicles that soar across the skies of eastern Kern County and the Greater Antelope Valley include military fighters as well as hypersonic vehicles and UAVs like the Global Hawk. NASA Dryden has performed research in such a vast multitude of areas that it eventually touches all our lives. Every airplane in the world has NASA technology in it. So there's not an airplane out there that in the, in the world that doesn't have technology that, that started here. The National Aeronautics Space Act of 1958 charged NASA with the responsibility to develop space access as well as to improve life on Earth. Transfer technology has taken the work that has been done at NASA and has applied it to areas outside of rocketry and aerospace to the benefit of humankind, including computers, cell phones, and materials, as well as monitoring and mapping of the Earth. The Apollo program and three decades of the space shuttle have been a driving force in advancing technology. The benefits in, in space access is really just uh, raising the entire the level of innovation, which you know has been America's uh, you know key to growth over the last uh, 200 years. Humans have mastered transportation by land and by sea, but it seems we are at our infancy when it comes to how we move through the air and beyond our atmosphere to space. Uh, you know we're still flying tubes with wings in aviation after a hundred years. Uh, we have spent uh, generations getting the last ounce of efficiency out of the engines. It's time we turn our attention to the airframe and get exponential efficiencies out of the airframe. The next generation of vehicles will improve efficiency by using improved materials and shapes like blended and hybrid wing bodies that focus on completely new designs. More energy efficient systems are also being pursued by the Air Force Research Laboratory. Propulsion is vital to every aerospace system the United States Air Force has. When you look at our satellites, 50 to 70 percent of the weight of the satellite is from the propulsion system. That's weight that you have to put into space. When you look at uh, access to space, 60 to 70 percent of the weight of a vehicle is the propulsion system just to get to orbit. So it's all about cost, it's all about driving down the weight, and you do that with better performance, you do that with better technologies, uh, better materials, and yet you have to put it into an engineering solution that's still going to work. You still want the, you, you still want the smoke and fire to come out the right end. The Air Force Research Laboratory, known as the AFRL, has been developing engines and propulsion systems for over 50 years that included the technology that allowed mankind going to the moon, the space shuttle rocketry, ICBMs or intercontinental ballistic missiles, as well as today's missile defense thrusters. Yeah, well, for the first 50, maybe 60 years of human space travel, it's been the domain of governments. But that, that is shifting. 
AFRL has strategic partnerships with both military installations such as China Lake, as well as commercial defense companies, including some at the Mojave Air and Spaceport. Uh, with uh, with the, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit uh, in, uh, in rocketry and uh, in access to space and, and the new excitement about space tourism, it's not necessarily just about uh, the defense anymore or, or uh, our, our classical astronauts in space, but it's about the average citizen uh, getting excited and wanting to go to space or work in the space. And, and the Mojave Spaceport provides that, provides just the perfect place to capture that, that, uh, that excitement where, while uh, Edwards Air Force Base still provides the backbone to do the kind of heavy lifting research and development that will enable those situations. The public-private partnerships that are the mainstay of this shift in leading the technology of aerospace advancement is ubiquitous. NASA is, is moving its uh, capability to, uh, to put humans into orbit to a focus on beyond low Earth orbit and is passing on the responsibility for access to space for low Earth orbit, for instance, access to the International Space Station to commercial space providers. Public-private partnerships are, are fundamental to, to our ability to survive. We're adapting in that way. When you get down to more routine, uh, repetitive work, that's where the private sector really shines. And that's when all of you, the, the costs start driving down exponentially and the, the, the reliability goes up and now you have a, a commerce beginning. And that's, that's where I see this industry. And I think um, sometimes private business has a little greater flexibility in what can be done. I think uh, at the Mojave Air and Spaceport, we have people who are visionary and dreamers and uh, we're willing to, to take the risk. I give people to succeed or fail in Mojave. I don't differentiate, if they wanna fail, Many of them will because we give them permissions to try different things. But if society is going to put such tight bounds on people that you can only succeed, I will guarantee you we're going nowhere. We've learned time and time again that we will always learn more from failure than we ever did from success. I think we need to really think about the balance of obsession of safety with our ability to explore if we're going to continue to be an exploring species. In 1958, the space race between the Soviet Union and the U.S. spurred our country's competitive sense, and we delved into engineering, science, technology, and math, which would have a great impact on our growth. That space race in the early, uh, late 50s and early 60s really propelled the uh, U.S. economy to where we're the dominant economy in the world. And, and a big part of the credit goes to aerospace technology development and, and perhaps NASA for developing the technologies that help propel the, the U.S. economy. We're in another phase now where we need to put a focus on, on scientific engineering, uh, math, uh, training for students and help pull that together so that the next generation can develop technologies that we've not even imagined yet. But it takes a, a core set of training to do that. Well, STEM's an acronym that uh, stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that science doesn't exist without mathematics. But the needs are there for our country. We have a, we have a generation uh, of scientists and engineers, uh, such as myself and others, who are going to be retiring over the next 10 years, 10 to 15 years, and we're gonna to need to replace that intellectual capability. And so uh, the, I, the idea of STEM and being able to reinvest uh, and develop that next generation of thinkers and problem solvers, you know, not only is that a responsibility for us, but it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Education is the, the foundation to everybody's future. At the same time, everything that we do as we educate our children, uh, this is for tomorrow. Their tomorrow, our local economies tomorrow, the regions tomorrow, our nations tomorrow. An investment in STEM education is clearly a factor in the advancement of aerospace, but it is also an investment in the survival of our species as well. As we move from mastering the skies above us to broadening our horizon to planetary travel, we are on the cusp of a new age. The next phase is, is really con a continuation of, of humanity's basic need to, to understand and know what's out there. So as much as we think we do things in isolation, uh, we don't. Uh, it, it affects people on the other side of the world. And so I think for the the betterment of, of humankind, 
uh, we have to have a global perspective. We, we can't just be insular. It's impossible anymore. Where does space fit in a global economy? Uh, I think that's at the root of every bit of this. And if you were to reach in your pocket and pull out your cell phone, you're holding something that is a fundamental payoff of our investment in space. It's lightweight. It's it's powerful. There's more computing power in an iPhone than took uh, the crew humans to the moon and brought them home. That is, that is a direct link to humans' investment in going to space. The ironies I found today are that cell phone that you carry in your pocket, 70% of the people on Earth have access to that and carry them. 70% of the humans' population. But the, the more ironic thing is only half of the people on Earth go home tonight have access to clean drinking water. So now we need to retool ourselves back on Earth. How can we continue to benefit from space and continue to uh, increase the value of human life on Earth and the quality of human life on Earth? That's, that's what's at the root of the entire question, but we are an exploring people. We need to continue to explore because as we explore, we benefit the quality of life on Earth. Thank you.